title page and forward of reflections on the formation and distribution of wealth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jeff edward dumas in el dorado arkansas reflections on the formation and distribution of wealth by anne robert jacques turgot translated by nicholas de condorcet title page and forward reflections on the formation and distribution of wealth by m turgot comptroller general of the finances of france in seventeen seventy four seventeen seventy five and seventeen seventy six translated from the french the tunnel page has a quote from condorcet's life of turgot quote, this essay may be considered as the germ for the treatise on the wealth of nations written by the celebrated smith End quote. M. Jergo, the author of the essay, who for three years held the important office of intendant or controller of the finances of France, was without exception one of the first political characters which the present century produced in the various employments of the master of requests, intendant of the province of Lismonche, minister of the French marine, and comptroller general of the finances of France, he labored assiduously to benefit his country. This, however, is his least eulogium. His writings entitle him to a higher praise, and he there shines in the revered character of a friend of mankind. An author who sends into the world detached pieces will seldom have the good fortune to reach that degree of celebrity which attends a more voluminous compiler although his works may at the same time possess a greater degree of intrinsic merit such has been the fate of m turgot his writings being in detached pieces are little known beyond the limits of his own country nor even there have his countrymen paid the tribute due to his excellent productions by collecting and publishing them together his essays on the commerce of grain on loans on mines and quarries the preambles to the arrests issued during his administration and the various important articles in the encyclopedia of etymology existence expansibility fair and foundation are all pieces of great merit but in no one does his capacious mind shine forth with greater lustre than in the work of which a translation is now offered to the public a work on the foundation of which was formed one of the most approved and justly celebrated treatises in the english language dr adam smith's essay on the wealth of nations this little piece fell by chance into the hands of the translator some time since and his admiration of it could only be equalled by his surprise at finding that no translation had appeared in the english language in order therefore that such of his countrymen as have not perused this admirable treatise in the original may not be deprived of the important knowledge it contains he has ventured to give it to the public in an english dress in which he has been studious to retain the author's sense and meaning seventeen ninety three end of title page and forward Passages 1 through 5 of Reflections on the Formation and Distribution of Wealth by Anne Robert Jacques Turgot, translated by Nicolas de Condorcet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 1. The impossibility of the existence of commerce upon the supposition of an equal division of lands, where every man should possess only what is necessary for his own support. If the land was divided among all the inhabitants of a country, so that each of them possessed precisely the quantity necessary for his support, and nothing more, it is evident that all of them being equal, no one would work for another. Neither would any of them possess wherewith to pay another for his labor. For each person having only such a quantity of land as was necessary to produce a subsistence would consume all he should gather, and would not have anything to give in exchange for the labor of others. 2. The above hypothesis neither has existed nor could continue. The diversity of soils and multiplicity of wants compel an exchange of the productions of the earth against other productions. This hypothesis never can have existed, because the earth has been cultivated before it has been divided, the cultivation itself having been the only motive for a division, and for that law which secures to every one his property. For the first persons who have employed themselves in cultivation have probably worked as much land as their strength would permit, and consequently more than was necessary for their own nourishment. If this state could have existed, 
it could not possibly be durable each one gathering from his field only a subsistence and not having wherewith to pay others for their labor would not be enabled to supply his other wants of lodging clothing etc etc except by the labor of his hands which would be nearly impossible as every soil does not produce every material the man whose land was only fit to produce grain and would neither bring forth cotton or flax would want linen to clothe him another would have ground proper for cotton which would not yield grain one would want wood for his fire and another be destitute of corn to support him experience would soon teach every one what species of productions his land was best adapted to and he would confine himself to the cultivation of it in order to procure himself those things he stood in need of by an exchange with his neighbors who having on their part acquired the same experience would have cultivated those productions which were best suited to their fields and would have abandoned the cultivation of any other Three the productions of the earth require long and difficult preparations before they are rendered fit to supply the wants of men the productions which the earth supplies to satisfy the different wants of man will not for the most part administer to those wants in the state nature affords them it is necessary they should undergo different operations and be prepared by art wheat must be converted into flour then into bread hides must be dressed or tanned wool and cotton must be spun silk must be taken from the cod hemp and flax must be soaked peeled spun and wove into different textures then cut and sewed together again to make garments etc if the same man who cultivates on his own land these different articles and who raises them to supply his wants was obliged to perform all the intermediate operations himself it is certain he would succeed very badly the greater part of these preparations require care attention and a long experience all which are only to be acquired by progressive labor and that on a great quantity of materials let us refer for example to the preparation of hides what laborer can pursue all the particular things necessary to those operations which continue several months sometimes several years if he is able to do it can he do it with a single hide what a loss of time of room and of materials which might be employed either at the same time or successively to ten a large quantity of skins but should he even succeed in manning a single skin and wants one pair of shoes what will he do with the remainder will he kill an ox to make this pair of shoes will he cut down a tree to make a pair of wooden shoes we may say the same thing of every other want of every other man who if he was reduced to his field and the labor of his own hands would waste much time take much trouble be very badly equipped in every respect and would also cultivate his lands very ill four the necessity of these preparations bring on the exchange of productions for labor the same motive which has established the exchange of commodity for commodity between the cultivators of land of different natures has also necessarily brought on the exchange of commodities for labor between the cultivators and another portion of society who shall have preferred the occupation of preparing and completing the productions of the earth to the cultivation of it every one profits by this arrangement for every one attaching himself to a peculiar species of labor succeeds much better therein the husbandman draws from his field the greatest quantity it is able to produce and procures to himself with greater facility all the other objects of his wants by an exchange of his superflux than he could have done by his own labor the shoemaker by making shoes for the husbandman secures to himself a portion of the harvest of the latter every workman labors for the wants of the workmen of every other trade who on their side toil also for him five preeminence of the husbandman who produces over the artificer who prepares the husbandman is the first mover in the circulation of labor it is he who causes the earth to produce the wages of every artificer it must however be observed that the husbandman furnishing every one with the most important and the most considerable objects of their consumption i mean their food and the materials of almost all manufactures 
has the advantage of a greater degree of independence his labor among the different species of labor appropriated to the different members of society supports the same preeminence and priority as the procuring of food did among the different works he was obliged in his solitary state to employ himself in in order to minister to his wants of every kind this is not a preeminence of honor or of dignity but of physical necessity the husbandman can generally speaking subsist without the labor of other workmen but no other workman can labor if the husbandman does not provide him wherewith to exist it is this circulation which by a reciprocal exchange of wants renders mankind necessary to each other and which forms the bond of society it is therefore the labor of the husbandman which gives the first movement what his industry causes the earth to produce beyond his personal wants is the only fund for the wages which all the other members of society receive in recompense for their toil the latter by availing themselves of the produce of this exchange to purchase in their turn the commodities of the husbandman only return to him precisely what they have received there is here a very essential difference between the two species of labor on which it is necessary to reflect and to be well assured of the ground on which they stand before we trust to the innumerable consequences which flow from them end of passages one through five passages six through ten of reflections on the formation and distribution of wealth by anne robert jacques turgot translated by nicholas de condorcet this librivox recording is in the public domain six the wages of the workman is limited by the competition among those who work for subsistence he only gains a livelihood the mere workman who depends only on his hands and his industry has nothing but such part of his labor as he is able to dispose of to others he sells it at a cheaper or a dearer price but this high or low price does not depend on himself alone it results from the agreement he has made with the person who employs him the latter pays him as little as he can help and as he has the choice from among a great number of workmen he prefers the person who works cheapest the workmen are therefore obliged to lower their price in opposition to each other in every species of labor it must and in effect it does happen that the wages of the workman is confined merely to what is necessary to procure him a subsistence seven the husbandman is the only one whose industry produces more than the wages of his labor he therefore is the only source of all wealth the situation of the husbandman is materially different the soil independent of any other man or of any agreement pays him immediately the price of his toil nature does not bargain with him or compel him to content himself with what is absolutely necessary what she grants is neither limited to his wants nor to a conditional valuation of the price of his day's work it is a physical consequence of the fertility of the soil and of justice rather than of the difficulty of the means which he has employed to render the soil fruitful as soon as the labor of the husbandman produces more than sufficient for his necessities he can with the excess which nature affords him of pure free will beyond the wages of his toil purchase the labor of other members of society the latter in selling to him only procures a livelihood but the husbandman besides his subsistence collects an independent wealth at his disposal which he has not purchased but which he can sell he is therefore the only source of all those riches which by their circulation animates the labors of society because he is the only one whose labor produces more than the wages of his toil eight first division of society into two classes the one productive or the cultivators the other stipendiary or the artificers 
here then is the whole society divided by the necessity founded on the nature of things into two classes both industrious one of which by its labour produces or rather draws from the earth riches continually renewing which supply the whole society with subsistence and with materials for all its wants while the other is employed in giving to the said materials such preparations and forms as render them proper for the use of man sells his labor to the first and receives in return a subsistence the first may be called the productive the latter the stipendiary class nine in the first ages of society the proprietors could not be distinguished from the cultivators hitherto we have not distinguished the husbandman from the proprietor of the land and in the first origin they were not in fact so distinguished it is by the labour of those who have first cultivated the fields and who have enclosed them to secure their harvest that all land has ceased to be common and that a property in the soil has been established until societies have been formed and until the public strength or the laws becoming superior to the force of individuals have been able to guarantee to every one the tranquil possession of his property against all invasion from without the property in the field could only be secured as it had been acquired by continuing to cultivate it the proprietor could not be assured of having his field cultivated by the help of another and that person taking all the trouble could not easily have comprehended that the whole harvest did not belong to him on the other hand in this early age when every industrious man would find as much land as he wanted he would not be tempted to labor for another it necessarily follows that every proprietor must cultivate his own field or abandon it entirely ten progress of society all lands have an owner but the land begins to people and to be cleared more and more the best lands are in process of time fully occupied there remains only for those who come last nothing but barren land rejected by the first occupants but at last every spot has found a master and those who cannot gain a property therein have no other resource but to exchange the labor of their hands in some of the employments of the stipendiary class for the excess of commodities possessed by the cultivating proprietor End of passages six through ten. passages eleven through fifteen of reflections on the formation and distribution of wealth by anne robert jacques turgot translated by nicholas de condorcet this librivox recording is in the public domain eleven the proprietors begin to be able to ease themselves of the labor of cultivation by the help of hired cultivators meantime since the earth produces to the proprietor who cultivates it not a subsistence only not only wherewith to procure himself by way of exchange what he otherwise wants but also a considerable superfluity he is enabled with this superfluity to pay other men to cultivate his land for among those who live by wages as many are content to labor in this employment as in any other the proprietor therefore might then be eased of the labor of culture and he soon was so twelve inequality in the division of property causes which render that inevitable the original proprietors would as i have already mentioned occupy as much land as their strength would permit them with their families to cultivate a man of greater strength more laborious more attentive about the future would occupy more than a man of a contrary character he whose family is the most numerous having greater wants and more hands extends his possessions further this is a first cause of inequality every piece of ground is not equally fertile two men with the same extent of land may reap a very different harvest this is a second source of inequality property in descending from fathers to their children divides into greater or less portions according as the descendants are more or less numerous and as one generation succeeds another sometimes the inheritances again subdivide and sometimes reunite again by the extinction of some of the branches this is a third source of inequality the difference of knowledge of activity and above all 
the economy of some contrasted with the indolence and action and dissipation of others is a fourth principle of inequality and the most powerful of all the negligent and inattentive proprietor who cultivates badly who in a fruitful year consumes in frivolous things the whole of his superfluity finds himself reduced on the least accident to request assistance from his more provident neighbor and to live by borrowing if by any new accident or by a continuation of his negligence he finds himself not in a condition to repay he is obliged to have recourse to new loans and at last has no other resource but to abandon a part or even the whole of his property to his creditor who receives it as an equivalent or to assign it to another in exchange for other valuables with which he discharges his obligation to his creditor thirteen consequences of this inequality the cultivator distinguished from the proprietor thus is the property in the soil made subject to purchase and sale the portion of the dissipating or unfortunate increases the share of the more happy or industrious proprietor and in this infinite variety of possessions it is not possible but a great number of proprietors must possess more than they can cultivate besides it is very natural for a rich man to wish for a tranquil enjoyment of his property and instead of employing his whole time in toilsome labor he rather prefers giving a part of his superfluity to people to work for him fourteen division of the produce between the cultivator and the proprietor net produce or revenue by this new arrangement the produce of the land divides into two parts the one comprehends the subsistence and the profits of the husbandman which are the rewards of his labor and the conditions on which he agrees to cultivate the field of the proprietor the other which remains is that independent and disposable part which the earth produces as a free gift to the proprietor over and above what he has dispersed and it is out of this share of the proprietors or what is called the revenue that he is enabled to live without labor and which he can carry wherever he will fifteen a new division of society into three classes cultivators artificers and proprietors or the productive stipendiary and disposable classes we now behold society divided into three branches the class of husbandmen whom we may denominate cultivators the class of artificers and others who work for hire upon the productions of the earth and the class of proprietors the only one which not being confined by a want of support to a particular species of labor may be employed in the general service of society as for war and the administration of justice either by a personal service or by the payment of a part of their revenue with which the state may hire others to fill these employments the appellation which suits the best with this division for this reason is that of the disposable class end of passages eleven through fifteen passages sixteen through twenty of reflections on the formation and distribution of wealth by n robert jacques turgot translated by nicholas de condorcet this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 16. Resemblance between the two laborious classes. The two classes of cultivators and artificers resemble each other in many respects, and particularly that those who compose them do not possess any revenue, and both equally subsist on the wages which are paid them out of the productions of the earth both have also this circumstance in common that they only gain the price of their labor and their disbursements and that this price is nearly the same in the two classes the proprietor agreeing with those who cultivate his ground to pay them as small a part as possible of its produce in the same manner as he bargains with the shoemaker to buy his shoes as cheap as he can in a word neither the cultivator nor the artificer receives more than a bare recompense for his labor 17. Essential Difference Between the Two Laborious Classes 
But there is this difference between the two species of labor, that the work of the cultivator produces not only his own wages, but also that revenue which serves to pay all the different classes of artificers and other stipendiaries their salaries, whereas the artificers receive simply their salary, that is to say, their part of the productions of the earth in exchange for their labor, and which does not produce any increase. The proprietor enjoys nothing but by the labor of the cultivator. He receives from him his subsistence, and wherewith to pay for the labor of the other stipendiaries. He has need of the cultivator by the necessity arising from the physical order of things, by which necessity the earth is not fruitful without labor. But the cultivator has no need of the proprietor but by virtue of human conventions, and of those civil laws which have guaranteed to the first cultivators and their heirs the property and the lands they had occupied, even after they ceased to cultivate them. But these laws can only secure to the idle man that part of the production of his land which it produces beyond the retribution due to the cultivators. The cultivator, confined as he is to a stipend for his labor, still preserves that natural and physical priority which renders him the first mover of the whole machine of society, and which causes both the subsistence and wealth of the proprietor, and the salaries paid for every other species of labor, to depend on his industry. The artificer, on the contrary, receives his wages either of the proprietor or of the cultivator, and only gives them, in exchange for his stipend, an equivalent in labor and nothing more. Thus, although neither the cultivator and artificer gain more than a recompense for their toil, yet the labor of the cultivator produces, besides that recompense, a revenue to the proprietor, while the artificer does not produce any revenue, either for himself or others. 18. This difference authorizes another distinction into the productive and barren classes. We may then distinguish the two classes not disposable into the productive class, which is that of the cultivators or the barren class, which comprehends all the other stipendiary members of society. 19. How the proprietors may draw a revenue from their lands. The proprietors who do not cultivate their lands themselves may adopt different methods of cultivating them, or make different agreements with those who cultivate them. 20. First method, or cultivation by laborers on wages. They may, in the first place, pay men by the day or the year to work their fields, and reserve to themselves the whole of the produce. This includes a supposition that the proprietor pays all advances, both for seed and the wages of the laborers, until after the harvest. But this method requires great labor and assiduity on the part of the proprietor, who alone can direct his men in their labor, see that they employ their time well, and watch over their fidelity, that they shall not carry away any part of the produce. It is true that he may pay a man of more knowledge, and whose fidelity he knows, who, in quality of manager and conductor, may direct the workmen and keep an account of the produce, but he will be always subject to fraud. Besides, this method is extremely expensive, unless a large population or want of employ in other species of labor forces the workmen to content themselves with very low salaries. End of passages 16 through 20passages 21 through 25 of Reflections on the Formation and Distribution of Wealth by Anne Robert-Jacques Turgot, translated by Nicolas de Condorcet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 21. Second Method, Cultivation by Slaves. In times not very distant from the origin of society, it was almost impossible to find men willing to work on the lands of another, because all the land not being as yet occupied, those who were willing to labor preferred the clearing of new lands and the cultivating them on their own account. This is pretty much the case in all new colonies. In this situation, violent men then conceived the expedient of obliging other men by force to labor for them. They employed slaves. 
these latter have had no justice to look for from the hands of people who have not been able to reduce them to slavery without violating all the laws of humanity meantime the physical law of nature secures to them their part of the productions which they have raised for the master must necessarily nourish them in order to profit by their labor but this species of recompense is confined to mere necessaries for their subsistence this abominable custom of slavery has formerly been universal and has spread over the greatest part of the globe the principal object of the wars carried on by the ancients was to carry off slaves whom the conquerors either compelled to work for them or sold to others this species of thieving and this trade still continues attended with all its cruel circumstances on the coast of guinea where the europeans encourage it by going thither to purchase negroes for the cultivation of the american colonies the excessive labor to which the greedy masters force their slaves causes many of them to perish and it becomes necessary to keep up the number requisite for cultivation that this trade should supply annually a very large number and since war is the principal source which supplies this commerce it is evident that it can subsist no longer than the people continue divided into very small nations who are incessantly plundering each other and every district is at continued war with its neighbors let england france and spain carry on the most cruel hostilities the frontiers alone of each state will be the only parts invaded and that in a few places only all the rest of the country will be quiet and the small number of prisoners they could make on either side would be but a weak resource for the cultivation of each of the three nations twenty two cultivation by slaves cannot exist in great societies thus when men are formed into great societies the recruits of slaves are not sufficiently numerous to support the consumption which the cultivation requires and although they supply the labor of men by that of beasts a time will come when the lands can no longer be worked by slaves the practice is then continued only for the interior work of the house and in the end it is totally abolished because in proportion as nations become polished they form conventions for the exchange of prisoners of war these conventions are the more readily made as every individual is very much interested to be free from the danger of falling into a state of slavery twenty three slavery annexed to the land succeeds to slavery properly so called the descendants of the first slaves attached at first to the cultivation of the ground change their condition the interior peace among nations not leaving wherewithal to supply the consumption of slaves the masters are obliged to take greater care of them those who were born in the house accustomed from their infancy to their situation revolt the less at it and their masters have less need to employ rigor to restrain them by degrees the land they cultivate becomes their country they become a part of the nation and in the end they experience confidence and humanity on the part of their masters twenty four vassalage succeeds to slavery annexed to the land and the slave becomes a proprietor third method alienation of the land for a certain service the administration of an estate cultivated by slaves requires a careful attention and an irksome residence the master secures to himself a more free more easy and more secure enjoyment of his property by interesting his slaves in the cultivation of it and by abandoning to each of them a certain portion of land on condition of their paying him a portion of the produce some have made this agreement for a time and have only left their serfs or slaves a precious and revocable possession others have assigned them lands in perpetuity refining an annual rent payable either in provisions or in money and requiring from the possessors certain services those who received these lands under the condition prescribed become proprietors and free under the name of tenant or vassal 
and the ancient proprietors, under the title of lords, reserved only the right of exacting payment of the rent, and other stipulated duties. Thus it has happened in the greater part of Europe. 25. Fourth Method, Partial Colonization these lands rendered free at the expense of rent may yet change masters may divide or reunite by means of succession and sale and such a vassal may in his turn have more than he can cultivate himself in general the rent to which those lands are subject is not so large but that by cultivating them well the cultivator is enabled to pay all advances and expenses procure himself a subsistence and besides an excess of productions which form a revenue Henceforth, the proprietary vassal becomes desirous of enjoying this revenue without labor, and of having his lands also cultivated by others. On the other hand, the greater part of the lords grant out those parts of their possessions only, which are the least within their reach, and retain those they can cultivate with the least experience. The cultivation by slaves not being practicable, the first method that offers, and the most simple to engage free men to cultivate lands which do not belong to them, was to resign to them such a portion of the produce as would engage them to cultivate better than those husbandmen who are employed at a fixed salary. The most common method has been to divide it into equal parts, one of which belonged to the cultivator and the other to the proprietor. This has given place to the name in France of Mitaye Muditaluis, or cultivator for half produce. In arrangements of this kind, which take place throughout the greatest part of France, the proprietor pays all contingencies, that is to say, he provides at his expense the cattle for labor, plows, and other utensils of husbandry seed and the support of the cultivator and his family from the time the latter enters into the metairie until the first harvest end of passages twenty one through twenty five passages twenty six through thirty of reflections on the formation and distribution of wealth by anne robert jacques Turgot, translated by nicholas de condorcet this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 26. Fifth Method Renting or Letting Out the Land Rich and intelligent cultivators, who saw to what perfection an active and well-directed cultivation, for which neither labor nor expense was spared, would raise the fruitfulness of land, judged with reason that they would gain more if the proprietors should consent to abandon for a certain number of years the whole of the harvest on condition of receiving annually a certain revenue and to be free of all expenses of cultivation by that they would be assured that the increase of productions which their disbursements and their labor procured would belong entirely to themselves the proprietor on his side would gain thereby first a more tranquil enjoyment of his revenue being freed from the care of advances and of keeping an account of the produce second a more equal enjoyment since he would receive every year the same and a more certain price for his farm because he would run no risk of losing his advances and the cattle and other effects with which the farmers had stocked it would become a security for his payment on the other hand the lease being only for a small number of years if his tenant paid him too little he could augment it at the expiration thereof 27. The last method is the most advantageous, but it supposes the country already rich. This method of securing lands is the most advantageous both to proprietors and cultivators. It is universally established where there are any rich cultivators in a condition to make the advances necessary for the cultivation and the rich cultivators are in a situation to bestow more labor and manure upon the ground there results from thence a prodigious augmentation in the productions and in the revenue of the land in picardy normandy the environs of paris and in most of the provinces in the north of france the lands are cultivated by farmers in those of the south by the metayers 
thus the northern are incomparably richer and better cultivated than the southern provinces twenty eight recapitulation of the several methods of making lands productive i have just mentioned five different methods by which proprietors are enabled to ease themselves of the labor of the cultivation and to make their land productive by the hands of others one by workmen paid at a fixed salary two by slaves three by ceding their lands for rent four by granting to the cultivator a determined portion which is commonly half the produce the proprietor paying the advances necessary for the cultivation five by letting their land to farmers who undertake to make all the necessary advances and who engage to pay to the proprietors during the number of years agreed on a revenue equal to its value of these five methods the first is too expensive and very seldom practiced the second is only used in countries as yet ignorant and barbarous the third is rather a means of procuring a value for than abandoning of the property for money so that the ancient proprietor is no longer anything more than a mere creditor the two last methods of cultivation are the most common that is the cultivation by metayer in the poor and by farmers in the richer countries twenty nine of capitals in general and of the revenue of money there is another way of being rich without labor and without possessing lands of which i have not yet spoken and of which it is necessary to explain the origin and connection with other parts of the system of the distribution of riches in society of which i have just drawn the outlines this consists in living by what is called the revenue of money or of the interest which is paid for the loan thereof thirty of the use of gold and silver in commerce gold and silver are two species of merchandise like others and less valuable than many of them because they are of no use for the real wants of life to explain how these two metals are become the representative pledges of every species of riches how they influence the commercial markets and how they enter into the composition of fortunes it is necessary to go back again and return to our first principles end of passages twenty six through thirty passages thirty one through thirty five of reflections on the formation and distribution of wealth by anne robert jacques turgot translated by nicholas de condorcet this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 31. Rise of Commerce Principle of the Valuation of Commercial Things Reciprocal wants first introduced exchanges of what we possessed, for what we stood in need of one species of provision was bartered for another, or for labor. In exchanging, it is necessary that each party is convinced of the quality and quantity of everything exchanged in this agreement it is natural that every one should desire to receive as much as he can and to give as little and both being equally masters of what they have to barter it is in a man's own breast to balance the attachment he has to the thing he gives with the desire he feels to possess that which he is willing to receive and consequently to fix the quantity of each of the exchanged things if the two persons do not agree, they must relax a little on one side or the other, either by offering more or being content with less. I will suppose that one is want of corn and the other of wine, and that they agree to exchange a bushel of corn for six pints of wine. It is evident that by both of them, one bushel of corn and six pints of wine are looked upon as exactly equivalent, and that in this particular exchange, the price of a bushel of corn is six pints of wine, and the price of six pints of wine is one bushel of corn. But in another exchange between other men, this price will be different, accordingly as one or the other of them shall have a more or less pressing want of one commodity or the other, and a bushel of corn may be exchanged against eight pints of wine, while another bushel shall be bartered for four pints only. 
Now it is evident that not one of these three prices can be looked on as the true price of a bushel of corn rather than the others. To each of the dealers, the wine he has received was equivalent to the corn he had given. In a word, so long as we consider each exchange independent of any other, the value of each thing exchanged has no other measure than the wants or desires of one party weighed with those of the other, and is fixed only by their agreement. 32. How the current value of the exchange of merchandise is established. Meantime, it happens that many individuals have wine to dispose of to those who possess corn. If one is not willing to give more than four pints for a bushel, the proprietor of the corn will not exchange with him, when he shall know that another will give him six or eight pints for the same bushel. If the former is determined to have the corn, he will be obliged to raise his price equal to what is offered by others. The sellers of wine profit on their side by the competition among the sellers of corn. No one resolves to part with his property before he has compared the different offers which are made to him of the commodity he stands in need of, and then he accepts of the best offer. The value of the wine and corn is not fixed by the two proprietors with respect to their own wants and reciprocal abilities, but by a general balance of the wants of all the sellers of corn with those of all the sellers of wine. For those who will willingly give eight pints of wine for a bushel of corn, will give but four when they shall know that a proprietor of corn is willing to give two bushels for eight pints. The medium price between the different offers and the different demands will become the current price to which all the buyers and sellers will conform in their exchanges. And it will be true if we say that six pints of wine will be to every one the equivalent for a bushel of corn, that is, the medium price, until a diminution of supply on one side or of demand on the other causes a variation. 33. Commerce gives to all merchandise a current value with respect to any other merchandise, from whence it follows that all merchandise is the equivalent for a certain quantity of any other merchandise, and may be looked on as a pledge to represent it. Corn is not only exchanged for wine, but also for any object which the proprietors of the corn may stand in need of, as wood, leather, woolen, cotton, etc., it is the same with wine and every other particular species. If a bushel of corn is equivalent to six pints of wine, and a sheep is equivalent to three bushels of corn, the same sheep will be equivalent to eighteen pints of wine. He who having the corn wants the wine may, without inconvenience, exchange his corn for a sheep, in order afterwards to exchange the sheep for the wine he stands in need of. 34. Every merchandise may serve as a scale or common measure by which to compare the value of any other. It follows from hence that in a country where the commerce is very brisk, where there are many productions and much consumption, where there are great supplies and a great demand for all sorts of commodities, every sort will have a current price, having relation to every other species. That is to say that a certain quantity of one will be of equal value to a certain quantity of any others. Thus the same quantity of corn, which is worth eighteen pints of wine, is also the value of a sheep, a piece of leather, or a certain quantity of iron, and all these things have, in the transactions of trade, an equal value. To express or make known the value of any particular thing, it is evident that it is sufficient to announce the quantity of any other known production, which will be looked on as an equivalent for it. Thus, to make known what a piece of leather of a certain size is worth, we may say indifferently that it is worth three bushels of corn, or eighteen pints of wine. We may by this same method express the value of a certain quantity of wine, by the number of sheep, or bushels of corn it will bring in trade. We see by this that every species of commodity that can be an object of commerce may be measured, as I may say, by each other, that every one may serve as a common measure or scale of comparison to describe the value of every other species, and in like manner every merchandise becomes in the hands of him who possesses it a means to procure all others, 
a sort of universal pledge. 35. Every species of merchandise does not present a scale equally commodious. It is proper to prefer the use of such as are not susceptible of any great alteration in quality, and have a value principally relative to the number and quantity. But although all merchandise has essentially this property of representing any other, is able to serve as a common measure to express its value, and to become a universal pledge to procure any of them by way of exchange, yet all cannot be employed with the same degree of facility for these two uses. The more susceptible any merchandise is to change its value by an alteration in its quality, the more difficult it is to make it a scale of reference for the value of others. For example, if 18 pints of wine of Anjou are equivalent in value to a sheep, 18 pints of Cape wine may be equivalent to 18 sheep. Thus he, who to express the value of a sheep, would say it is worth 18 pints of wine, would employ an equivocal language, and would not communicate any precise idea, at least until he added some explanation, which would be very inconvenient. We are therefore obliged to choose for a scale of comparison such commodities as being more commonly in use, and consequently of a value more generally known, are more like each other, and of which, consequently, the value has more relation to the quantity than the quality. End of passages 31 through 35passages 36 through 40 of Reflections on the Formation and Distribution of Wealth by Anne Robert-Jacques Turgot translated by Nicolas de Condorcet This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 36 For want of an exact correspondence between the value and the number or quantity, it is supplied by a mean valuation, which becomes a species of real money. In a country where there are only one race of sheep, we may easily take the value of a fleece or of a sheep by the common method of valuation, and we may say that a barrel of wine or a piece of stuff is worth a certain number of fleeces or of sheep. There is in reality some inequality in sheep, but when we want to sell them, we take care to estimate that inequality and to reckon, for example, two lambs for one sheep. When it is necessary to treat of the relative value of other merchandise, we fix the common value of a sheep of middling age and quality as the symbol of unity. In this view, the enunciation of the value of sheep becomes an agreed language, and this word, one sheep, in the language of commerce, signifies only a certain value, which, in the mind of him who understands it, carries the idea not only of a sheep, but as a certain quantity of every other commodity, which is esteemed equivalent thereto. And this expression is more applicable to a fictitious and abstract value than to the value of a real sheep, that if by chance a mortality happens among the sheep, and that to purchase one of them you must give double the quantity of corn or wine that was formerly given, we shall rather say that one sheep is worth two sheep, then change the expression we have been accustomed to for all other valuations. 37. Example of those mean valuations which become an ideal expression for value. There exists in the commerce of every nation many examples of fictitious valuations of merchandise, which are, as we may say, only a conventional language to express their value. Thus the cooks of Paris and the fishmongers who furnish great houses generally sell by the piece. A fat pullet is esteemed one piece, a chicken half a piece, more or less, according to the season, and so of the rest. In the negro trade in the American colonies, they sell a cargo of negroes at the rate of so much per negro, an Indian piece. The women and children are valued so that, for example, three children, or one woman and two children, are reckoned as one head of negro. They increase or diminish the value on account of the strength or other quality of the slaves, so that certain slaves are reckoned as two heads of negroes. 
the mandingo negroes who carry on a trade for gold dust with the arabian merchants bring all their commodities to a fictitious scale which both parties call makoots so that they tell the merchants they will give so many makoots in gold they value thus in makoots the merchandise they receive and bargain with the merchants upon that valuation thus in holland they reckon by bank florins which is only a fictitious money and which in commerce is sometimes of a greater sometimes of a less value than the coin which is denominated a florin thirty eight all merchandise is a representative pledge of every object of commerce but more or less commodities for use as it possesses a greater or less facility to be transported and to be preserved without alteration the variation in the quality of merchandise and in the different prices in proportion to that quality which renders them more or less proper than others to serve as a common measure is more or less an impediment to their being a representative pledge of every other merchandise of equal value nevertheless there is also as to this last property a very essential difference between the different species of merchandise it is for example evident that a man who possesses a piece of linen is more certain of procuring for it when he pleases a certain quantity of corn than if he had a barrel of wine of equal value the wine being subject to a variety of accidents which may in a moment deprive him of the whole property thirty nine all merchandise has the two essential properties of money to measure and to represent all value and in this sense all merchandise is money these two properties of serving as a common measure of all value and of being a representative pledge of all other commodities of equal value comprehend all that constitute the essence and use of what is called money and it follows from the details which i have just now given that all merchandise is in some respect money and participates more or less according to its particular nature of these two essential properties all is more or less proper to serve as a common measure in proportion as it is more or less in general use of a more similar quality and more easy to be divided into aliquot parts all is more or less applicable for the purpose of a general pledge of exchange in proportion as it is less susceptible of decay or alteration in quantity or quality forty reciprocally all money is essentially merchandise we can take only that which has a value for a common measure of value that which is received in commerce in exchange for other properties and there is no universal representative pledge of value but something of equal value a money of convention is therefore a thing impossible end of passages thirty six through forty passages forty one through forty five of reflections on the formation and distribution of wealth by anne robert jacques turgot translated by nicholas de condorcet this librivox recording is in the public domain forty one different matters are able to serve and have served for current money many nations have adopted in their language and in their trade as a common measure of value different matters more or less precious there are at this day some barbarous nations who make use of a species of little shells called cowries i remember to have seen when at college some apricot stones exchanged and passed as a species of money among the scholars who made use of them at certain games i have already spoken of a valuation by heads of cattle some of these are to be found in the vestiges of the laws of the ancient german nations who overran the roman empire the first romans or at least the latins their ancestors made use of them also it is pretended that the first money they struck in brass represented the value of a sheep and bore the image of that animal and that the name of pecunia has obtained from pecus this conjecture carries with it a great probability 42. 
metals and particularly gold and silver are the most proper for that purpose and why we are now arrived at the introduction of the precious metals into trade all metals as they have been discovered have been admitted into exchange on account of their real utility their splendor has caused them to be sought for to serve as ornaments their ductility and their solidity have rendered them proper for utensils more durable and lighter than those of clay but these substances cannot be brought into commerce without becoming almost immediately a universal money a piece of any metal of whatever sort has exactly the same qualities as another piece of the same metal provided they are both equally pure now the ease with which we can separate by different chemical operations a metal from other metals with which it is incorporated enables us to bring it to a degree of purity or as they call it to what standard we please then the value of metal differs only as to its weight in expressing therefore the value of any merchandise by the weight of metal which may be had in exchange we shall then have the clearest the most commodious and most precise expression of value and hence it is impossible but it must be preferred in practice to all other things nor are metals less proper than other merchandise for becoming the universal token of all value that can be measured as they are susceptible of all imaginable divisions there is not any object of commerce great or small whose value cannot be exactly paid by a certain quantity of metal to this advantage of accommodating itself to every species of division they join that of being unalterable and those which are scarce as gold and silver have a great value although of a weight and size little considerable these two metals are then of all merchandise the most easy to ascertain their quality to divide their quantity and to convey to all places at the easiest expense every one therefore who has a superfluity and who is not at the time in want of another useful commodity will hasten to exchange it for silver with which he is more certain than with anything else to procure himself the commodity he shall wish for at the time he is in want forty three gold and silver are constituted by the nature of things money and universal money independent of all convention and of all laws here then is gold and silver constituted money and universal money and that without any arbitrary agreement among men without the intervention of any law but only by the nature of things they are not as many people imagine signs of value they have an intrinsic value in themselves if they are capable of being the measure and the token of other values this property they have in common with all other commodities which have a value in commerce they only differ in being at the same time more divisible more unchangeable and of more easy conveyance than other merchandise by which they are more commodiously employed to measure and represent the value of others forty four other metals are only employed for these uses in a secondary manner all metals are capable of being employed as money but those which are too common have too little value in large bulk to be employed in the current uses of commerce copper silver and gold are the only ones which have been brought into constant use and even copper except among people to whom neither mines nor commerce have supplied a sufficient quantity of gold or silver has never been used but in exchanges of small value forty five the use of gold and silver as money has augmented their value as materials it is not possible but the eagerness with which every one has sought to exchange their superfluous commodities for gold and silver rather than for any other commodity must have augmented the value of these two materials in commerce these are only thereby rendered more commodious for their employment as tokens or common measure end of passages forty one through forty five Passages 46 through 50 of Reflections on the Formation and Distribution of Wealth by Anne Robert Jacques Turgot, translated by Nicolas de Condorcet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
46. Variations in the value of gold and silver compared with the other objects of commerce and with each other. This value is susceptible of change and in truth is continually changing, so that the same quantity of metal which answered to a certain quantity of such or such a commodity becomes no longer equal thereto, and it requires a greater or less quantity of silver to represent the same commodity. When it requires more, it is said the commodity is dearer. When it requires less, that it is become cheaper. But they may as well say that the silver is in the first case become cheaper, and in the latter dearer. Silver and gold not only vary in price compared with all other commodities, but they vary also with each other in proportion as they are more or less abundant. It is notorious that we now give in Europe from 14 to 15 ounces of silver for one ounce of gold, and that in former times we gave only 10 or 11 ounces. Again, that at present in China, they do not give more than 12 ounces of silver for one ounce of gold, so that there is a very great advantage in carrying silver to China to exchange for gold to bring back to Europe. It is visible that in process of time this commerce will make gold more common in Europe and less common in China, and that the value of these two materials must finally come in both places to the same proportion. A thousand different causes concur to fix and to change incessantly the comparative value of commodities, either with respect to each other or with respect to silver. The same causes conspire to fix and vary the comparative value, whether in respect to the value of each commodity in particular, or with respect to the totality of the other values which are actually in commerce. It is not possible to investigate these different causes, or to unfold their effects, without entering into very extensive and very difficult details, which I shall decline in this discussion. 47. The use of payments in money has given room for the distinction of seller and buyer. In proportion as mankind became familiarized to the custom of valuing all things in silver, of exchanging all their superfluous commodities for silver, and of not parting with that money but for things which are useful or agreeable to them at the moment, they become accustomed to consider the exchanges of commerce in a different point of view. They have made a distinction of two persons, the buyer and the seller. The seller is him who gives commodities for money and the buyer is him who gives money for commodities. 48. The use of money has much facilitated the separation of different labors among the different orders of society. The more money becomes a universal medium, the more everyone is enabled by devoting himself solely to that species of cultivation and industry of which he has made choice to divest himself entirely of every thought for his other wants and only to think of providing the most money he can by the sale of his fruits or his labor, being sure with that money to possess all the rest. It is thus that the use of money has prodigiously hastened the progress of society. 49. Of the excess of annual produce accumulated to form capitals. As soon as men are found whose property in land assures them an annual revenue more than sufficient to satisfy all their wants, among them there are some who, either uneasy respecting the future or perhaps only provident, lay by a portion of what they gather every year, either with a view to guard against possible accidents or to augment their enjoyments. When the commodities they have gathered are difficult to preserve, they ought to procure themselves in exchange such objects of a more durable nature, and such as will not decrease in their value by time, or those that may be employed in such a manner as to procure such profits as will make good the decrease with advantage. 50. Personal Property accumulation of money. 
this species of possession resulting from the accumulation of annual produce not consumed is known by the name of personal property household goods houses merchandise in store utensils of trade and cattle are under this denomination it is evident men must have toiled hard to procure themselves as much as they could of this kind of wealth before they became acquainted with the use of money but it is not less evident but as soon as it was known that it was the least liable to alteration of all the objects of commerce and the most easy to preserve without trouble it would be principally sought after by whoever wished to accumulate it was not the proprietors of land only who thus accumulated their superfluity although the profits of industry are not like the revenue of lands a gift of nature and the industrious man draws from his labor only the price which is given him by the persons who pay him his wages although the latter is as frugal as he can of his salary and that a competition obliges an industrious man to content himself with a less price than he otherwise would do it is yet certain that these competitions have neither been so numerous or strong in any species of labor but that a man more expert more active and who practices more economy than others in his personal expenses has been able at all times to gain a little more than sufficient to support him and his family and reserve his surplus to form a little hoard end of passages forty six through fifty Passages 51 through 55 of Reflections on the Formation and Distribution of Wealth by Anne Robert Jacques Turgot, translated by Nicolas de Condorcet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 51. Circulating wealth is an indispensable requisite for all lucrative works it is even necessary that in every trade the workmen or those who employ them possess a certain quantity of circulating wealth collected beforehand we here again are obliged to go back to a retrospect of many things which have been as yet only hinted at after we have spoken of the division of different professions and of the different methods by which the proprietors of capitals may render them of value because otherwise we should not be able to explain them properly without interrupting the connection of our ideas. 52. Necessity of Advances for Cultivation Every species of labor, of cultivation, of industry, or of commerce require advances. When people cultivate the ground, it is necessary to sow before they can reap. They must also support themselves until after the harvest. The more cultivation is brought to perfection and enlivened, the more considerable these advances are. Cattle, utensils for farming, buildings to hold the cattle, to store the productions, a number of persons in proportion to the extent of the undertaking must be paid and subsisted until the harvest. It is only by means of considerable advances that we obtain rich harvests and that lands produce a large revenue. In whatever business they engage, the workmen must be provided with tools, must have a sufficient quantity of such materials as the object of his labor requires, and he must subsist until the sale of his goods. 53. First advance furnished by the land, although uncultivated. The earth was ever the first and the only source of all riches. It is that which by cultivation produces all revenue. It is that which has afforded the first fund for advances anterior to all cultivation. The first cultivator has taken the grain he has sown from such productions as the land had spontaneously produced while waiting for the harvest he has supported himself by hunting by fishing or upon wild fruits his tools have been the branches of trees procured in the forests and cut with stones sharpened upon other stones the animals wandering in the woods he has taken in the chase caught them in his traps or has subdued them unawares at first he has made use of them for food 
afterwards to help him in his labors these first funds or capital have increased by degrees cattle were in early times the most sought after of all circulating property and were also the easiest to accumulate they perish but they also breed and this sort of riches is in some respects unperishable this capital augments by generation alone and affords an annual produce either in milk wool leather and other materials which with wood taken in the forest have effected the first foundations for works of industry fifty four cattle a circulating wealth even before the cultivation of the earth in times when there was yet a large quantity of uncultivated land and which did not belong to any individual cattle might be maintained without having a property in land it is even probable that mankind have almost everywhere began to collect flocks and herds and to live on what they produced before they employed themselves in the more laborious occupation of cultivating the ground it seems that those nations who first cultivated the earth are those who found in their country such sorts of animals as were the most susceptible of being tamed and that they have by this been drawn from the wandering and restless life of hunters and fishers to the more tranquil enjoyment of pastoral pursuits pastoral life requires a longer residence in the same place affords more leisure more opportunities to study the difference of lands to observe the ways of nature and the productions of such plants as serve for the support of cattle perhaps it is for this reason that the asiatic nations have first cultivated the earth and that the inhabitants of america have remained so long in a savage state fifty five another species of circulating wealth and advances necessary for cultivation slaves the slaves were another kind of personal property which at first were procured by violence and afterwards by way of commerce and exchange those that had many employed them not only in the culture of land but in various other channels of labor the facility of accumulating almost without measure those two sources of riches and of making use of them abstractedly from the land cost the land itself to be estimated and the value compared to movable riches end of passages fifty one through fifty five passages fifty six through sixty of reflections on the formation and distribution of wealth by n robert jacques turgot translated by nicholas de condorcet this librivox recording is in the public domain fifty six personal property has an exchangeable value even for land itself a man that would have been possessed of a quantity of lands without cattle or slaves would undoubtedly have made an advantageous bargain in yielding a part of his land to a person that would have offered him in exchange cattle and slaves to cultivate the rest it is chiefly by this principle that property and land entered likewise into commerce and had a comparative value with that of all other goods if four bushels of corn the net produce of an acre of land was worth six sheep the acre itself that feeds them could have been given for a certain value greater indeed but always easy to settle by the same way as the price of other wares namely at first by debates among the two contractors next by the current price established by the agreement of those who exchange land for cattle or the contrary it is by the scale of this current specie that lands are appraised when a debtor is prosecuted by his creditor and is constrained to yield up his property fifty seven valuations of lands by the proportion of their revenue with the sum of personal property or the value for which they are exchanged this proportion is called the price of lands it is evident that if land which produces a revenue equivalent to six sheep can be sold for a certain value which may always be expressed by a number of sheep equivalent to that value this number will bear a fixed proportion with that of six and will contain it a certain number of times 
thus the price of an estate is nothing else but its revenue multiplied a certain number of times twenty times if the price is a hundred and twenty sheep thirty times if one hundred and eighty sheep and so the current price of land is reckoned by the proportion of the value of the revenue and the number of times that the price of the sale contains that of the revenue is called so many years purchase of the land they are sold at the price of twenty thirty or forty years purchase when on purchasing them we pay twenty thirty or forty times their revenue it is also not less evident that this price must vary according to the number of purchasers or sellers of land in the same manner as other goods vary in a ratio to the different proportion between the offer and the demand fifty eight all capital and money and all value whatever is equivalent to land producing a revenue equal to a determined sum first employ of capitals purchase of lands let us now go back to the time after the introduction of money the facility of accumulating it has soon rendered it the most desirable part of personal property and has afforded the means of augmenting by economy the quantity of it without limits whoever either by the revenue of his land or by the salary of his labor or industry receives every year a higher income than he needs to spend may lay up the residue and accumulate it these accumulated values are what we name a capital the pusillanimous miser that keeps his money with the mere view of soothing his imagination against apprehension of distress and the uncertainty of futurity keeps his money in a hoard if the dangers he had foreseen should eventually take place and he in his poverty be reduced to live every year upon the treasure or a prodigal successor lavish it by degrees this treasure would soon be exhausted and the capital totally lost to the possessor the latter can draw a far greater advantage from it for an estate in land of a certain revenue being but an equivalent of a sum of value equal to the revenue taken a certain number of times it follows that any sum whatsoever of value is equivalent to an estate in land producing a revenue equal to a fixed proportion of that sum it is perfectly the same whether the amount of this capital consists in a mass of metal or any other matter since money represents all kinds of value as well as all kinds of value represent money by these means the possessor of a capital may at first employ it in the purchase of lands but he is not without other resources fifty nine another employment for money in advances for enterprises of manufacture or industry i have already observed that all kinds of labor either of cultivation or industry required advances and i have shown how the earth by the fruits and herbages it spontaneously produces for the nourishment of men and animals and by the trees of which man has first formed his utensils had furnished the first advances for cultivation and even of the first manual works a man can perform for his own service for instance it is the earth that provides the stone clay and wood of which the first houses were built and before the division of professions when the same man that cultivated the earth provided also for his other wants by his own labor there was no need of other advances but when a great part of society began to have no resource but in their hands it was necessary that those who lived thus upon salaries should have somewhat beforehand that they might either procure themselves the materials on which they labored or subsist during the time they were waiting for their salary sixty explanation of the use of the advances of capitals in enterprises of industry on their returns and the profits they ought to produce in early times he that employed laboring people under him furnished the materials himself and paid from day to day the salaries of the workmen it was the cultivator or the owner himself that gave to the spinner the hemp he had gathered and he maintained her during the time of her working thence he passed the yarn to a weaver to whom he gave every day the salary agreed upon 
but those slight daily advances can only take place in the coarsest works. A vast number of arts, and even of those arts indispensable for the use of the most indigent members of society, require that the same materials should pass through many different hands, and undergo, during a considerable space of time, difficult and various operations. I have already mentioned the preparation of leather, of which shoes are made. Whoever has seen the workhouse of a tanner cannot help feeling the absolute impossibility of one or even several indigent persons providing themselves with leather, lime, tan, utensils, etc., and causing the requisite buildings to be erected to put the tan house to work, and of their living during a certain space of time, till their leather can be sold. In this art, and many others, must not those that work on it have learned the craft before they presume to touch the materials, lest they should waste them in their first trials? Here, then, is another absolute necessity of advances. Who shall now collect the materials for the manufactory, the ingredients, the requisite utensils for their preparation? Who is to construct canals, markets, and buildings of every denomination? How shall that multitude of workmen subsist till the time of their leather being sold, and of whom none individually would be able to prepare a single skin, and where the emolument of the sale of a single skin could not afford subsistence to any one of them? Who shall defray the expenses for the instruction of the pupils and apprentices? Who shall maintain them until they are sufficiently instructed, guiding them gradually from an easy labor proportionate to their age to works that demand more vigor and ability? It must then be one of those proprietors of capitals or movable accumulated property that must employ them, supplying them with advances in part for the construction and purchase of materials and partly for the daily salaries of the workmen that are preparing them. It is he that must expect the sale of the leather, which is to return him not only his advances, but also an emolument sufficient to indemnify him for what his money would have procured him had he turned it to the acquisition of lands, and moreover of the salary due to his troubles and care, to his risk, and even to his skill, for surely upon equal profits he would have preferred living without solicitude on the revenue of land which he could have purchased with the same capital. In proportion as this capital returns to him by the sale of his works, he employs it in new purchases for supporting his family and maintaining his manufactory. By this continual circulation he lives on his profits, and lays by in store what he can spare to increase his stock, and to advance his enterprise by augmenting the mass of his capital in order proportionably to augment his profits. End of passages 56 through 60。passages 61 through 65 of Reflections on the Formation and Distribution of Wealth by Anne Robert Jacques Turgot, translated by Nicolas de Condorcet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 61. Subdivisions of the industrious stipendiary class in undertaking capitalists and simple workmen. Thus the whole class employed in supplying the different wants of society with an immense variety of works of industry is, if I may speak thus, subdivided into two classes. The one of the undertakers, manufacturers, and masters, all proprietors of large capitals, which they avail themselves of by furnishing work to the other class, composed of artificers, destitute of any property but their hands, who advance only their daily labor, and receive no profits but their salaries. 62. Another employment of capitals, and advances towards undertakings of agriculture, observations on the use, and indispensable profits of capitals in undertakings of agriculture. In speaking first of the placing of capitals in manufacturing enterprises, I had in view to adduce a more striking example of the necessity and effect of large advances, and of the course of their circulation. But I have reversed the natural order, 
which seemed to require that I should rather begin to speak of enterprises of agriculture, which also can neither be performed, nor extended, nor afford any profit, but by means of considerable advances. It is the proprietors of great capitals who, in order to make them productive in undertakings of agriculture, take leases of lands, and pay to the owners large rents, taking on themselves the whole burthen of advances. Their case must necessarily be the same as that of the undertakers of manufactures. Like them, they are obliged to make the first advances towards the undertaking, to provide themselves with cattle, horses, utensils of husbandry, to purchase the first seeds. Like them, they must maintain and nourish their carters, reapers, threshers, servants, and laborers of every denomination, who subsist only by their hands, who advance only their labor, and reap only their salaries. Like them, they ought to have not only their capital, I mean, all their prior and annual advances returned, but first, a profit equal to the revenue they could have acquired with their capital, exclusive of any fatigue. Secondly, the salary, and the price of their own trouble, of their risk, and their industry. Thirdly, an emolument to enable them to replace the effects employed in their enterprise, and the loss by waste, cattle dying, and utensils wearing out, etc., all which ought to be first charged on the productions of the earth. The overplus will serve the cultivator to pay to the proprietor for the permission he has given him to make use of his field in the accomplishing of his enterprise. That is the price of the leasehold, the rent of the proprietor, and the clear product for all that the land produces, until reimbursement of the advances and profits of every kind to him that has made these advances cannot be looked upon as a revenue, but only as a reimbursement of the expenses of the cultivation since if the cultivator could not obtain them he would be loath to risk his wealth and trouble in cultivating the field of another sixty three the competition between the capitalists undertakers of cultivation fixes the current price of leases of lands the competition between rich undertakers of cultivation fixes the current price of leases in proportion to the fertility of the soil and of the rate at which its productions are sold, always according to the calculation which farmers make both of their expenditures and of the profits they ought to draw from their advances. They cannot give to the owners more than the overplus, but when the competition among them happens to be more animated, they sometimes render him the whole overplus the proprietor leasing his land to him that offers the greatest rent. 64. The default of capitalists, undertakers, limits the cultivation of lands to a small extent. When, on the contrary, there are no rich men that possess capitals large enough to embark in enterprises of agriculture, when, through the low rate of the productions of the earth, or any other cause, the crops are not sufficient to ensure to the undertakers, besides the reimbursement of their capital, emoluments adequate at least to those they would derive from their money, by employing it in some other channel, there are no farmers that offer to lease lands, the proprietors are constrained to hire mercenaries, or metayers, which are equally unable to make any advances or duly to cultivate it. The proprietor himself makes moderate advances which only produce him an indifferent revenue. If the land happens to belong to an owner, poor, negligent, and in debt, to a widow or a minor, it remains unmanured. Such is the principle of the difference I have observed between provinces where the lands are cultivated by opulent farmers, as in Normandy and the Isle de France, and those where they are cultivated only by indigent mercenaries, as in Limousin, Angoumois, Bourbonnais, and several others. 65. Subdivisions of the class of cultivators into undertakers, or farmers, and hired persons, servants, and day-laborers. 
hence it follows that the class of cultivators may be divided like that of manufacturers into two branches the one of undertakers or capitalists who make the advances the other of simple stipendiary workmen it results also that capitals alone can form and support great enterprises of agriculture that give to the lands an unvariable value if i may use the expression and that secure to the proprietors a revenue always equal and the largest possible end of passages sixty one through sixty five passages sixty six through seventy of reflections on the formation and distribution of wealth by m robert jacques turgot translated by nicolas de condorcet this librivox recording is in the public domain sixty six fourth employment of capitals in advances for enterprises of commerce necessity of the interposition of merchants properly so called between the producers of the commodities and the consumers the undertakers either in cultivation or manufacture draw their advances and profits only from the sale of the fruits of the earth or the commodities fabricated it is always the wants and the ability of the consumer that sets the price on the sale but the consumer does not want the produce prepared or fitted up at the moment of the crop or the perfection of the work however the undertakers want their stocks immediately and regularly reimbursed to embark in fresh enterprises the manuring and the seed ought to succeed the crops without interruption the workmen of a manufacture are unceasingly to be employed in beginning other works in proportion as the first are distributed and to replace the materials in proportion as they are consumed it would not be advisable to stop short in an enterprise once put in execution nor is it to be presumed that it can be begun again at any time it is then the strictest interest of the undertaker to have his capital quickly reimbursed by the sale of his crop or commodities on the other hand it is the consumer's interest to find when and where he wishes it the things he stands in need of it would be extremely inconvenient for him to be necessitated to make at the time of the crop his provision for the whole course of a year among the objects of usual consumption there are many that require long and expensive labors labors that cannot be undertaken with profit except on a large quantity of materials and on such as the consumption of a small number of inhabitants of a limited district may not be sufficient for even the sale of the work of a single manufactory undertakings of this kind must then necessarily be in a reduced number at a considerable distance from each other and consequently very distant from the habitations of the greater number of consumers there is no man not so oppressed under the extremest misery that is not in a situation to consume several things which are neither gathered nor fabricated except in places considerably distant from him and not less distant from each other a person that could not procure himself the objects of his consumption but in buying it directly from the hand of him that gathers or works it would be either unprovided with many commodities or pass his life in wandering after them this double interest which the person producing and the consumer have the former to find a purchaser the other to find where to purchase and yet not to waste useful time in expecting a purchaser or in finding a seller has given the idea to a third person to stand between the one and the other and it is the object of the mercantile profession who purchase goods from the hands of the person who produces them to store them in warehouses whither the consumer comes to make his purchase by these means the undertaker assured of the sale and the reacquisition of his funds looks undisturbed and indefatigably out for new productions and the consumer finds within his reach and at once the objects of which he is in want sixty seven different orders of merchants they all are alike employed in purchasing to sell again and their traffic is supported by advances which are to revert with a profit to be engaged in new enterprises 
from the green woman who exposes her ware in a market to the merchants of nantes or cadiz who traffic even to india and america the profession of a trader or what is properly called commerce divides into an infinity of branches and it may be said of degrees one trader confines himself to provide one or several species of commodities which he sells in his shop to those who choose another goes with certain commodities to a place where they are in demand to bring from thence in exchange such things as are produced there and are wanted in the place from whence he departed one makes his exchanges in his own neighborhood and by himself another by means of correspondence and by the interposition of carriers whom he pays employs and sends from one province to another from one kingdom to another from europe to asia and from asia back to europe one sells his merchandise by retail to those who use them another only sells in large parcels at a time to other traders who retail them out to the consumers but all have this in common that they buy to sell again and that their first purchases are advances which are returned to them only in course of time they ought to be returned to them like those of the cultivators and manufacturers not only within a certain time to be employed again in new purchases but also one with an equal revenue to what they could acquire with their capital without any labor two with the value of their labor of their risk and of their industry without being assured of this return and of these indispensable profits no trader would enter into business nor could any one possibly continue therein tis in this view he governs himself in his purchases on a calculation he makes of the quantity and the price of the things which he can hope to dispose of in a certain time the retailer learns from experience by the success of limited trials made with precaution what is nearly the wants of those consumers who deal with him the merchant learns from his correspondence of the plenty or scarcity and of the price of merchandise in those different countries to which his commerce extends he directs his speculations accordingly he sends his goods from the country where they bear a low price to those where they are sold dearer including the expense of transportation and the calculation of the advances he ought to be reimbursed since trade is necessary and it is impossible to undertake any commerce without advances proportionable to its extent we here see another method of employing personal property a new use that the possessor of a parcel of commodities reserved and accumulated of a sum of money in a word of a capital may make of it to procure himself subsistence and to augment his riches sixty eight the true idea of the circulation of money we see by what has been just now said how the cultivation of lands manufactures of all kinds and all the branches of trade depend on a mass of capital or the accumulation of personal property which having been at first advanced by the undertakers in each of these different branches ought to return to them again every year with a regular profit that is the capital to be again invested and advanced in the continuation of the same enterprises and the profits employed for the greater or less subsistence of the undertakers it is this continued advance and return which constitutes what ought to be called the circulation of money this useful and fruitful circulation which animates all the labor of society which supports all the motion and is the life of the body politic and which is with great reason compared to the circulation of the blood in the human body for if by any disorder in the course of the expenses of the different orders of society the undertakers cease to draw back their advances with such profit as they have a right to expect it is evident they will be obliged to reduce their undertakings that the total of the labor of the consumption of the fruits of the earth of the productions and of the revenue would be equally diminished that poverty will succeed to riches and that the common workmen ceasing to find employ will fall into the deepest misery sixty nine all extensive undertakings particularly those of manufactures and of commerce must indispensably have been very confined before the introduction of gold and silver in trade 
it is almost unnecessary to remark that undertakings of all kinds but especially those of manufactures and above all those of commerce must unavoidably be very confined before the introduction of gold and silver in trade since it was almost impossible to accumulate considerable capitals and yet more difficult to multiply and divide payments so much as is necessary to facilitate and increase the exchanges to that extent which a spirited commerce and circulation require the cultivation of the land only may support itself to a certain degree because the cattle are the principal cause of the advances required therein and it is very probable there is then no other adventurer in cultivation but the proprietor as to arts of all kinds they must necessarily have been in the greatest languor before the introduction of money they were confined to the coarsest works for which the proprietors supported the advances by nourishing the workmen and furnishing them with materials or they caused them to be made in their own houses by their servants seventy capitals being as necessary to all undertakings as labor and industry the industrious man shares voluntarily the profits of his enterprise with the owner of the capital who furnishes him the funds he is in need of since capitals are the indispensable foundation of all lucrative enterprises since with money we can furnish means for culture establish manufactures and raise a commerce the profits of which being accumulated and frugally laid up will become a new capital since in a word money is the principal means to beget money those who with industry and the love of labor are destitute of capital and have not sufficient for the undertaking they wish to embark in have no difficulty in resolving to give up to the proprietors of such capital or money who are willing to trust them a portion of the profits which they are in expectation of gaining over and above their advances end of passages sixty six through seventy Passages seventy one through seventy five of Reflections on the Formation and Distribution of Wealth by Anne Robert Jacques Turgot, translated by Nicolas de Condorcet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Seventy one. Fifth Employment of Capitals Lending on Interest. Nature of a Loan. The possessors of money balance the risk their capital may run, if the enterprise does not succeed, with the advantage of enjoying a constant profit without toil, and regulate themselves thereby to require more or less profit or interest for their money, or to consent to lend it for such an interest as the borrower offers. Here another opportunity opens to the possessor of money, viz., lending on interest or the commerce of money let no one mistake me here lending on interest is only a trade in which the lender is a man who sells the use of his money and the borrower one who buys precisely the same as the proprietor of an estate or the person who farms it buys and sells respectively the use of the hired land the latin term for a loan of money or interest expresses it exactly usura pecunia a word which adopted into the french language is become odious by a consequence of false ideas being adopted on the interest of money seventy two false ideas on lending upon interest the rate of interest is by no means founded as may be imagined on the profit the borrower hopes to make with the capital of which he purchases the use. This rate, like the price of all other merchandise, is fixed by the circumstances of buyer and seller, by the proportion of the sum offered with the demand. People borrow with every kind of view and with every sort of motive. One borrows to undertake an enterprise that is to make his fortune, another to buy an estate, another to pay his losses at play, another to supply the loss of his revenue of which some accident has deprived him 
another to exist on in expectation of what he is able to gain by his labor but all these motives which determine the borrower are very indifferent to the lender he attends to two things only the interest he is to receive and the safety of his capital he never attends to the use the borrower puts it to as a merchant does not care to what use the buyer applies the commodities he sells him seventy three errors of the schoolmen refuted it is for want of having examined the lending of money on interest in its true point of view that moralists more rigid than enlightened would endeavor to make us look on it as a crime scholastic theologists have concluded that as money itself was not prolific it was unjust to require a premium for the loan of it full of these prejudices they have fancied their doctrine was sanctioned by this passage in the gospel mutum datum nihil indes parentes those theologians who have adopted more reasonable principles on the subject of interest of money have been branded with the harshest reproaches from those who adopt the other side of the question nevertheless there are but few reflections necessary to expose the trifling reasons that are adduced to condemn the taking of interest a loan of money is a reciprocal contract free between both parties and entered into only by reason of its being mutually advantageous it is evident if the lender finds an advantage in receiving an interest for his money the borrower is not less interested in finding that money he stands in need of since otherwise he would not borrow and submit himself to the payment of interest now on this principle can any one look on such an advantageous contract as a crime in which both parties are content and which certainly does no injury to any other person let them say the lender takes advantage of the wants of the borrower to force the payment of interest this is talking as absurd as if we were to say that a baker who demands money for the bread he sells takes advantage of his customer's wants if in this latter case the money is an equivalent for the bread the buyer receives the money which the borrower receives today is equally an equivalent for the capital and interest he agrees to pay at the expiration of a certain time for in fact it is an advantage to the borrower to have during that interval the use of the money he stands in need of and it is a disadvantage to the lender to be deprived of it this disadvantage may be estimated and it is estimated the interest is the rate this rate ought to be larger if the lender runs a risk of losing his capital by the borrower becoming insolvent the bargain therefore is perfectly equal on both sides and consequently fair and honest money considered as a physical substance as a mass of metal does not produce anything but money made use of in advances in cultivation in manufacture in commerce produces a certain profit with money we can acquire land and thereby procure a revenue the person therefore who lends his money does not only give up the unfruitful possession of such money but deprives himself of the profit which it was in his power to procure by it and the interest which indemnifies him from this loss cannot be looked upon as unjust the schoolmen compelled to acknowledge the justice of these considerations have allowed that interest for money may be taken provided the capital is alienated that is provided the lender gave up his right to be reimbursed his money in a certain time and permitted the borrower to retain it as long as he was inclined to pay the interest thereof only the reason of this toleration was that then it is no longer a loan of money for which an interest is paid but a purchase which is bought with a sum of money as we purchase lands this was a mode to which they had recourse to comply with the absolute necessity which exists of borrowing money in the course of the transactions of society without fairly avowing the fallacy of those principles upon which they had condemned the practice but this clause for the alienation of the capital is not an advantage to the borrower who remains equally indebted to the lender 
until he shall have repaid the capital, and whose property always remains as a security for the safety of such capital. It is even a disadvantage, as he finds it more difficult to borrow money when he is in want of it. For persons who would willingly consent to lend for a year or two, a sum of money which they had destined for the purchase of an estate would not lend it for an uncertain time. Besides, if they are permitted to sell their money for a perpetual rent, why may they not lend it for a certain number of years for a rent which is only to continue for that term? If an interest of one thousand livra per annum is equivalent to the sum of twenty thousand livra from him to keep such a sum in perpetuity, one thousand livra will be an equivalent for the possession of that sum for one year. 74 true foundation of interest of money a man then may lend his money as lawfully as he may sell it and the possessor of money may either do one or the other not only because money is equivalent to a revenue and a means to procure a revenue not only because the lender loses during the continuance of the loan the revenue he might have procured by it not only because he risks his capital not only because the borrower can employ it in advantageous acquisitions or in undertakings from whence he will draw a large profit, the proprietor of money may lawfully receive the interest of it by a more general and decisive principle. Even if none of these circumstances should take place, he will not have the less right to require an interest for his loan for this reason only, that his money is his own. Since it is his own, he has a right to keep it. Nothing can imply a duty in him to lend it. If then he does lend, he may annex such a condition to the loan as he chooses. In this he does no injury to the borrower, since the latter agrees to the conditions, and has no sort of right over the sum lent. The profit which the money can procure the borrower is doubtless one of the most prevailing motives to determine him to borrow on interest. It is one of the means which facilitates his payment of the interest. But this is by no means that which gives a right to the lender to require it. It is sufficient for him that the money is his own, and this is a right inseparable from property. He who buys bread does it for his support, but the right the baker has to exact a price is totally independent of the use of bread, the same right he would possess in the sale of a parcel of stones, a right founded on this principle only, that the bread is his own, and no one has any right to oblige him to give it up for nothing. 75. Answer to an Objection this reflection brings us to the consideration of the application made by an author of the text Mutum Datum Nihil Inde Sperintes, and shows how false that application is, and how distant from the meaning of the gospel. The passage is clear, as interpreted by modern and reasonable divines, as a precept of charity. All mankind are bound to assist each other. A rich man who should see his fellow creature in distress, and who, instead of gratuitously assisting, should sell him what he needed, would be equally deficient in the duties of Christianity and of humanity. In such circumstances, charity does not only require us to lend without interest, she orders us to lend, and even to give if necessary. To convert the precept of charity into a precept of strict justice is equally repugnant to reason and the sense of the text. Those whom I here attack do not pretend that it is a duty of justice to lend their money. They must be obliged then to confess that the first words of the passage, mutum datum, contain only a precept of charity. Now I demand why they extend the latter part of this passage to a principle of justice. What is the duty of lending not a strict precept? And shall its accessory only, the condition of the loan, be made one? 
it would have been said to man it is free for you to lend or not to lend but if you do lend take care you do not require any interest for your money and even when a merchant shall require a loan of you for an undertaking in which he hopes to make a large profit it will be a crime in you to accept the interest he offers you you must absolutely either lend to him gratuitously or not lend to him all you have indeed one method to make the receipt of interest lawful it is to lend your capital for an indefinite term and to give up all right to be repaid it which is to be optional to your debtor when he pleases or when he can if you find any inconvenience on the score of security or if you foresee you shall want your money in a certain number of years you have no other course to take but not to lend it is better for you to deprive this merchant of this most fortunate opportunity than to commit a sin by assisting him this is what they must have seen in these five words mutum datum nihil inde sperentes when they have read them under these false prejudices every man who shall read this text unprejudiced will soon find its real meaning that is as men as christians you are all brothers all friends act towards each other as brethren and friends help each other in your necessities let your purses be reciprocally open to each other and do not sell that assistance which you are mutually indebted to each other in requiring an interest for a loan which charity requires of you as a duty this is the true sense of the passage in question the obligation to lend without interest and to lend have evident relation to each other they are of the same order and both inculcate a duty of charity and not a precept of rigorous justice applicable to all cases of lending end of passages seventy one through seventy five Passages 76 through 80 of Reflections on the Formation and Distribution of Wealth by Anne Robert Jacques Turgot, translated by Nicolas de Condorcet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 76. The rate of interest ought to be fixed, as the price of every other merchandise, by the course of trade alone. I have already said that the price of money borrowed is regulated like the price of all other merchandise, by the proportion of the money at market with the demand for it. Thus, when there are many borrowers who are in want of money, the interest of money rises. When there are many possessors who are ready to lend, it falls. It is therefore an error to believe that the interest of money in trade ought to be fixed by the laws of princes it has a current price fixed like that of all other merchandise the price varies a little according to the greater or less security which the lender has but on equal security he ought to raise and fall his price in proportion to the abundance of the demand and the law no more ought to fix the interest of money than it ought to regulate the price of any other merchandises which have a currency in trade. 77. Money has in commerce two different valuations. One expresses the quantity of money or silver we give to procure different sorts of commodities. The other expresses the relation a sum of money has to the interest it will procure in the course of trade. It seems by this explanation of the manner in which money is either sold or lent for an annual interest that there are two ways of valuing money in commerce. In buying and selling, a certain weight of silver represents a certain quantity of labor, or of merchandise of every species. For example, one ounce of silver is equal to a certain quantity of corn, or to the labor of a man for a certain number of days. In lending and in the commerce of money, a capital is the equivalent of an equal rent to a determinate portion of that capital, and reciprocally an annual rent represents a capital equal to 
the amount of that rent repeated a certain number of times according as interest is at a higher or lower rate seventy eight these two valuations are independent of each other and are governed by quite different principles these two different methods of fixing a value have much less connection and depend much less on each other than we should be tempted to believe at first sight money may be very common in ordinary commerce may hold a very low value answer to a very small quantity of commodities and the interest of money may at the same time be very high i will suppose there are one million ounces of silver in actual circulation in commerce and that an ounce of silver is given in the market for a bushel of corn i will suppose that there is brought into the country in some manner or other another million of ounces of silver and this augmentation is distributed to every one in the same proportion as the first million so that he who had before two ounces now has four the silver considered as a quantity of metal will certainly diminish in price or which is the same thing commodities will be purchased dearer and it becomes necessary in order to procure the same measure of corn which he had before with one ounce of silver to give more silver perhaps two ounces instead of one but it does not by any means follow from thence that the interest of money falls if all this money is carried to market and employed in the current expenses of those who possess it as it is supposed the first million of ounces of silver was for the interest of money falls only when there is a greater quantity of money to be lent in proportion to the wants of the borrowers than there was before now the silver which is carried to market is not to be lent it is money which is hoarded up which forms the accumulated capital for lending and the augmentation of the money in the market or the diminution of its price in comparison with commodities in the ordinary course of trade are very far from causing infallibly or by a necessary consequence a decrease in the interest of money on the contrary it may happen that the cause which augments the quantity of money in the market and which consequently increases the price of other commodities by lowering the value of silver is precisely the same cause which augments the hire of money or the rate of interest in effect i will suppose for a moment that all the rich people in a country instead of saving from the revenue or from their annual profits shall expend the whole that not satisfied with expending their whole revenue they dissipate a part of their capital that a man who has a hundred thousand livres in money instead of employing them in a profitable manner or lending them consumes them by degrees in foolish expenses it is apparent that on one side there will be more silver employed in common circulation to satisfy the wants and humours of each individual and that consequently its value will be lowered on the other hand there will certainly be less money to be lent and as many people will in this situation of things ruin themselves there will clearly be more borrowers the interest of money will consequently augment while the money itself will become more plenty in circulation and the value of it will fall precisely by the same cause we shall no longer be surprised at this apparent inconsistency if we consider that the money brought into the market for the purchase of corn is that which is daily circulated to procure the necessaries of life but that which is offered to be lent on interest is what is actually drawn out of that circulation to be laid by and accumulated into a capital seventy nine in comparing the value of money with that of commodities we consider silver as a metal which is an object of commerce in estimating the interest of money we attend to the use of it during a determinate time in the market a measure of corn is purchased with a certain weight of silver or a quantity of silver is bought with a certain commodity it is this quantity which is valued and compared with the value of other commodities in a loan upon interest 
the object of the valuation is the use of a certain quantity of property during a certain time it is in this case no longer a mass of silver compared with a quantity of corn but it is a portion of effects compared with a certain portion of the same which has become the customary price of that mass for a certain time let twenty thousand ounces of silver be an equivalent in the market for twenty thousand measures of corn or only for ten thousand the use of those twenty thousand ounces of silver for a year is not worth less on a loan than the twentieth part of the principal sum or one thousand ounces of silver if interest is at five per cent eighty the price of interest depends immediately on the proportion of the demand of the borrowers with the offer of the lenders and this proportion depends principally on the quantity of personal property accumulated by an excess of revenue and of the annual produce to form capitals whether these capitals exist in money or in any other kind of effects having a value in commerce the price of silver in circulation has no influence but with respect to the quantity of this metal employed in common circulation but the rate of interest is governed by the quantity of property accumulated and laid by to form a capital it is indifferent whether this property is in metal or other effects provided these effects are easily convertible into money it is far from being the case that the mass of metal existing in a state is as large as the amount of the property lent on interest in the course of a year but all the capitals in furniture merchandise tools and cattle supply the place of silver and represent it a paper signed by a man who is known to be worth one hundred thousand livres and who promises to pay one hundred marks in a certain time is worth that sum the whole property of the man who has signed this note is answerable for the payment of it and whatever the nature of these effects consists provided they are in value one hundred thousand livres it is not therefore the quantity of silver existing as merchandise which causes the rate of interest to rise or fall or which brings more money in the market to be lent it is only the capitals existing in commerce that is to say the actual value of personal property of every kind accumulated successively saved out of the revenues and profits to be employed by the possessors to procure them new revenues and new profits it is these accumulated savings which are offered to the borrowers and the more there are of them the lower the interest of money will be at least if the number of borrowers is not augmented in proportion End of passages 76 through 80passages 81 through 85 of reflections on the formation and distribution of wealth by m robert jacques turgot translated by nicolas de condorcet this librivox recording is in the public domain 81 the spirit of economy continually augments the amount of capitals luxury continually tends to destroy them the spirit of economy in any nation tends incessantly to augment the amount of the capitals to increase the number of lenders and to diminish that of the borrowers the habit of luxury has precisely a contrary effect and by what has been already remarked on the use of capitals in all undertakings whether of cultivation manufacture or commerce we may judge if luxury enriches a nation or impoverishes it 82. The lowering of interest proves that in Europe economy has in general prevailed over luxury. Since the interest of money has been constantly diminishing in Europe for several centuries, we must conclude that the spirit of economy has been more general than the spirit of luxury. It is only people of fortune who run into luxury, and among the rich, the sensible part of them confine their expenses within their incomes, and pay great attention not to touch their capital. 
those who wish to become rich are far more numerous in a nation than those which are already so now in the present state of things as all the land is occupied there is but one way to become rich it is either to possess or to procure in some way or other a revenue or an annual profit above what is absolutely necessary for subsistence and to lay up every year in reserve to form a capital by means of which they may obtain an increase of revenue or annual profit which will again produce another saving and become capital there are consequently a great number of men interested and employed in amassing capitals eighty three recapitulation of the five different methods of employing capitals i have reckoned five different methods of employing capitals or of placing them so as to procure a profit first to buy an estate which brings in a certain revenue second to employ money in undertakings of cultivation in leasing lands whose produce should render back besides the expenses of farming the interest on the advances and a recompense for the labor of him who employs his property and attention in the cultivation third to place a capital in some undertaking of industry or manufactures fourth to employ it in commerce fifth to lend it to those who want it for an annual interest eighty four the influence which the different methods of employing money have on each other it is evident that the annual returns which capitals placed in different employees will produce are proportionate to each other and all have relation to the actual rate of the interest of money eighty five money invested in land necessarily produces less the person who invests his money in land let to a solvent tenant procures himself a revenue which gives him very little trouble in receiving and which he may dispose of in the most agreeable manner by indulging all his inclinations there is a greater advantage in the purchase of this species of property than of any other since the possession of it is more guarded against accidents we must therefore purchase a revenue in land at a higher price and must content ourselves with a less revenue for an equal capital End of passages eighty one through eighty five passages eighty six through ninety of reflections on the formation and distribution of wealth by Anne Robert Jacques Turgot, translated by Nicolas de Condorcet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. eighty six Money on interest ought to bring a little more income than land purchased with an equal capital he who lends his money on interest enjoys it still more peaceably and freely than the possessor of land but the insolvency of his debtor may endanger the loss of his capital he will not therefore content himself with an interest equal to the revenue of the land which he could buy with an equal capital the interest of money lent must consequently be larger than the revenue of an estate purchased with the same capital for if the proprietor could find an estate to purchase of an equal income he would prefer that eighty seven money employed in cultivation manufactures or commerce ought to produce more than the interest of money on loan by a like reason money employed in agriculture in manufactures or in commerce ought to produce a more considerable profit than the revenue of the same capital employed in the purchase of lands or the interest of money on loan for these undertakings besides the capital advanced requiring much care and labor and if they were not more lucrative it would be much better to secure an equal revenue which might be enjoyed without labor it is necessary then that besides the interest of the capital the undertaker should draw every year a profit to recompense him for his care his labor his talents the risk he runs 
and to replace the wear and tear of that portion of his capital which he is obliged to invest in effects capable of receiving injury and exposed to all kinds of accidents eighty eight meantime the freedom of these various employments are limited by each other and maintain notwithstanding their inequality a species of equilibrium the different uses of the capitals produce very unequal profits but this inequality does not prevent them from having a reciprocal influence on each other nor from establishing a species of equilibrium among themselves like that between two liquors of unequal gravity and which communicate with each other by means of a reversed siphon the two branches of which they fill there can be no height to which the one can rise or fall but the liquor in the other branch will be affected in the same manner i will suppose that on a sudden a great number of proprietors of lands are desirous of selling them it is evident that the price of lands will fall and that with a less sum we may acquire a larger revenue this cannot come to pass without the interest of money rising for the possessors of money would choose rather to buy lands than to lend at a lower interest than the revenue of the lands they could purchase if then the borrowers want to have money they will be constrained to pay a greater rate if the interest of the money increases they will prefer lending it to setting out in a hazardous manner on enterprises of agriculture industry and commerce and they will be aware of any enterprises but those that produce besides the retribution for their trouble an emolument by far greater than the rate of the lender's produce in a word if the profits springing from any use of money augment or diminish the capitals are converted by withdrawing them from other employings or are withdrawn by converting them to other ends which necessarily alters in each of those employments the proportion of profits on the capital to the annual product generally money converted into property in land does not bring in so much as money on interest and money on interest brings less than money used in laborious enterprises but the produce of money laid out in any way whatever cannot augment or decrease without implying a proportionate augmentation or decrease in other employments of money eighty nine the current interest of money is the standard by which the abundance or scarcity of capitals may be judged it is the scale on which the extent of a nation's capacity for enterprises in agriculture manufactures and commerce may be reckoned thus the current interest of money may be considered as a standard of the abundance or scarcity of capitals in a nation and of the extent of enterprises of every denomination in which she may embark it is manifest that the lower the interest of money is the more valuable is the land a man that has an income of fifty thousand livres if the land is sold but at the rate of twenty years purchase is an owner of only one million he has two millions if the land is sold at the rate of forty if the interest is at five per cent any land to be brought into cultivation would continue fallow if besides the recovery of the advances and the retribution due to the care of the cultivator its produce would not afford five per cent no manufactory no commerce can exist that does not bring in five per cent exclusively of the salary and equivalents for the risk and trouble of the undertaker if there is a neighboring nation in which the interest stands only at two per cent not only it will engross all the branches of commerce from which the nation where an interest at five per cent is established is excluded but its manufacturers and merchants enabled to satisfy themselves with a lower interest will also sell their goods at a more moderate price and will attract the almost exclusive commerce of all articles which they are not prevented to sell by particular circumstances of excessive dearth and expenses of carriages from the nation in which the interest bears five per cent ninety influence of the rate of interest of money on all lucrative enterprises the price of the interest may be looked upon as a kind of level 
under which all labor, culture, industry, or commerce acts. It is like a sea expanded over a vast country. The tops of the mountains rise above the surface of the water, and form fertile and cultivated islands. If this sea happens to give way in proportion as it descends sloping ground, then plains and valleys appear, which cover themselves with productions of every kind. It wants no more than a foot elevation or falling to inundate or to restore culture to unmeasurable tracts of land. It is the abundance of capitals that animates enterprise, and a low interest of money is at the same time the effect and a proof of the abundance of capitals. End of passages 86 through 90passages 91 through 95 of Reflections on the Formation and Distribution of Wealth by Anne Robert Jacques Turgot translated by Nicolas de Condorcet This LibriVox recording is in the public domain 91 The total riches of a nation consists 1 in the clear revenue of all the real estates multiplied by the rate of the price of land 2 in the sum of all the movable riches existing in a nation. Real estates are equivalent to any capital equal to their annual revenue multiplied by the current rate at which lands are sold. Thus, if we add the revenue of all lands, viz., the clear revenue they render to the proprietor and to all those that share in the property, as the lord that levies a rent, the curate that levies the tithe, the sovereign that levies the tax, if I say we should add all these sums, and multiply them by the rate at which lands are sold, we would have the sum of all the wealth of a nation and real estates. To have the whole of a nation's wealth, the movable riches ought to be joined, which consist in the sum of capitals converted into enterprises of culture, industry, and commerce, which is never lost, as all advances in any kind of undertaking must unceasingly return to the undertaker to be unceasingly converted into enterprises, which without that could not be continued. It would be a gross mistake to confound the immense mass of movable riches with the mass of money that exists in a state. The latter is a small object in comparison with the other. To convince one's self of this, we need only remember the immense quantity of beasts, utensils, and seed which constitute the advances of agriculture, the materials, tools, movables, and merchandises of every kind that fill up the workhouses, shops, and warehouses of all manufacturers, of all merchants, and of all traders, and it will be plain that in the totality of riches, either real or movable, of a nation, the specie makes but an inconsiderable part, but all riches and money, being continually exchangeable, they all represent money, and money represents them all. 92. The sum of lent capitals cannot be understood without a twofold reckoning. We must not include in the calculation of the riches of a nation the sum of lent capitals, for the capitals could only be lent either to proprietors of lands or to undertakers to enhance their value in their enterprises, since there are but these two kinds of people that can answer for a capital and discharge the interest. A sum of money lent to people that have neither estate nor industry would be a dead capital and not an active one. If the owner of land of 400,000 livres borrows 100,000, his land is charged with a rent that diminishes his revenue by that sum. If he should sell it, out of the 400,000 livres he would receive, 100,000 are the property of the creditor. By these means, the capital of the lender would always form, in the calculation of existing riches, a double estimate. The land is always worth 400,000. When the proprietor borrows 100,000, that does not make 500,000. It only follows that in the 400,000, 100,000 belongs to the lender, and that there remains no more than 300,000 to the borrower. 
the same double estimate would have a place in the calculation if we should comprehend in the total calculation of capitals the money lent to an undertaker to be employed in advance for his undertaking it only results that that sum and the part of the profits which represents the interest belongs to the lender let a merchant employ ten thousand livres of his property in his trade and engross the whole profit or let him have those ten thousand livres borrowed of another to whom he pays the interest and is satisfied with the overplus of profit and the salary of his industry it still makes only ten thousand livres but if we cannot include without making a double estimate in the calculation of national riches the capital of the money lent on interest we ought to call in the other kinds of movables which though originally forming an object of expense and not carrying any profit become however by their durability a true capital that constantly increases and which as it may occasionally be exchanged for money is as if it were a stock in store which may enter into commerce and make good when necessary the loss of other capitals such are the movables of every kind jewels plates paintings statues ready money shut up in chests by misers all those matters have a value and the sum of all those values may make a considerable object among wealthy nations yet be it considerable or not it must always be added to the price of real estates and to that of circulating advances in enterprises of every denomination in order to form the total sum of the riches of a nation as for the rest it is superfluous to say though it is easy to be defined as we have just done in what consists the totality of the riches of a nation it is probably impossible to discover to how much they amount unless some rule be found out to fix the proportion of the total commerce of a nation with the revenue of its land a feasible thing but which has not been executed as yet in such a manner as to dispel all doubts ninety three in which of the three classes of society the lenders of money are to be ranked let us see now how what we have just discussed about the different ways of employing capitals agrees with what we have before established about the division of all the members of society into three classes the one the productive class of husbandmen the industrious or trading class and the disposing class or the class of proprietors 94 the lender of money belongs as to his persons to the disposing class we have seen that every rich man is necessarily possessor either of a capital in movable riches or funds equivalent to a capital any estate and land is of equal value with a capital consequently every proprietor is a capitalist but not every capitalist a proprietor of a real estate and the possessor of a movable capital may choose to confer it on acquiring funds or to improve it in enterprises of the cultivating class or of the industrious class the capitalist turned an undertaker in culture or industry is no more of the disposing class than the simple workman in these two lines they are both taken up in the continuation of their enterprises the capitalist who keeps to the lending money lends it either to a proprietor or to an undertaker if he lends it to a proprietor he seems to belong to the class of proprietors and he becomes co-partitioner in the property the income of the land is destined to the payment of the interest of his trust the value of the funds is equal to the security of his capital if the money lender has lent to an undertaker it is certain that his person belongs to the disposing class but his capital continues destined to the advances of the enterpriser and cannot be withdrawn without hurting the enterprise or without being replaced by a capital of equal value ninety five 
the use which the money lender makes of his interest. Indeed, the interest he draws from that capital seems to make him of the disposing class, since the undertaker and the enterprise may shift without it. It seems also we may form an inference that in the profits of the two laborious classes, either in the culture of the earth or industry, there is a disposable portion, namely, that which answers to the interest of the advances calculated on the current rate of interest of money lent. It appears also that this conclusion seems to agree with what we have said, that the mere class of proprietors had a revenue properly so called, a disposing revenue, and that all the members of the other classes had only salaries or profits. This merits some future inquiry. If we consider the thousand crowns that a man receives annually, who has lent sixty thousand livres to a merchant, in respect to the use he may make of it, there is no doubt of this being perfectly disposable, since the enterprise may subsist without it. End of passages 91 through 95passages ninety six through one hundred and one of reflections on the formation and distribution of wealth by anne robert jacques turgot translated by nicholas de condorcet this librivox recording is in the public domain ninety six the interest of the money is not disposable in one sense viz so as the state may be authorized to appropriate without any inconvenience a part to supply its wants. But it does not ensue that they are of the disposing class in such a sense that the state can appropriate to itself with propriety a portion for the public wants. Those one thousand crowns are not a retribution which culture or commerce bestows gratuitously on him that makes the advance. It is the price and the condition of this advance, independently of which the enterprise could not subsist. If this retribution is diminished, the capitalist will withdraw his money, and the undertaking will cease. This retribution ought, then, to be inviolable, and enjoy an entire immunity, because it is the price of an advance made for the enterprise, without which the enterprise could not exist. To encroach upon it would cause an augmentation in the price of advances in all enterprises, and, consequently, diminish the enterprises themselves, that is to say, cultivation, industry, and commerce. This answer should lead us to infer that if we have said that the capitalist who had lent money to a proprietor seemed to belong to the class of proprietors, this appearance had somewhat equivocal in it which wanted to be elucidated. In fact, it is strictly true that the interest of his money is not more disposable, that is, it is not more susceptible of retrenchment than that of money lent to the undertakers in agriculture and commerce. But the interest is equally the price of the free agreement, and they cannot retrench any part of it without altering or changing the price of the loan. For it imports little to whom the loan has been made, if the price decreases or augments for the proprietor of lands, it will also decrease and augment for the cultivator, the manufacturer, and the merchant. In a word, the proprietor who lends money ought to be considered as a dealer in a commodity absolutely necessary for the production of riches, and which cannot be at too low a price. It is also as unreasonable to charge this commerce with duties as it would be to lay a duty on a dunghill which serves to manure the land. Let us conclude from hence that the person who lends money belongs properly to the disposable class as to his person, because he has nothing to do but not as to the nature of his property, whether the interest of his money is paid by the proprietor of land out of a portion of his income, or whether it is paid by an undertaker out of a part of his profits designed to pay the interest of his advances. 97. Objection It may doubtless be objected that the capitalist 
may indifferently either lend his money or employ it in the purchase of land that in either case he only receives an equivalent for his money and whichever way he has employed it he ought not the less to contribute to the public charges ninety eight answer to this objection i answer first that in fact when the capitalist has purchased an estate the revenue will be equal as to him to what he would have received for his money by lending it but there is this essential difference with respect to the state that the price which he gives for his land does not contribute in any respect to the income it produces it would not have produced a less income if he had not purchased it this income as we have already explained consists in what the land produces beyond the salary of the cultivators of their profits and the interest of their advances it is not the same with the interest of money it is the express condition of the loan the price of the advance without which the revenue or profits which serve to pay it could never exist i answer in the second place that if the lands were charged separately with the contribution to the public expenses as soon as that contribution shall be once regulated the capitalist who shall purchase these lands will not reckon as interest for his money that part of the revenue which is affected by this contribution the same as a man who now buys an estate does not buy the tithe which the curate or clergy receives but the revenue which remains after that tithe is deducted ninety nine there exists no revenue strictly disposable in a state but the clear produce of lands it is manifest by what i have said that the interest of money lent is taken on the revenue of lands or on the profits of enterprises of culture industry and commerce but we have already shown that these profits themselves were only a part of the production of lands that the produce of land is divided in two portions that the one was designed for the salary of the cultivator for his profits for the recovery and interest of his advances and that the other was the part of the proprietor or the revenue which the proprietor expended at his option and from whence he contributes to the general expenses of the state we have demonstrated that what the other classes of society received was merely the salaries and profits paid either by the proprietor upon his revenue or by the agents of the productive class on the part destined to their wants and which they are obliged to purchase of the industrious class whether these profits be now distributed in wages to the workmen in profits to undertakers or in interests of advances they do not change the nature or augment the sum of the revenue produced by the productive class over and above the price of their labor in which the industrious class does not participate but as far as the price of their labor extends hence it follows that there is no revenue but the clear produce of land and that all other profit is paid either by that revenue or makes part of the expenditure that serves to produce the revenue 100. The land has also furnished the total of movable riches, or existing capitals, and which are formed only by a portion of its production reserved every year. Not only there does not exist, nor can exist, any other revenue than the clear produce of land, but it is the earth also that has furnished all capitals, that form the mass of all the advances of culture and commerce. It has produced, without culture, the first gross and indispensable advances of the first laborers. All the rest are the accumulated fruits of the economy of successive ages since they have begun to cultivate the earth. This economy has effect not only on the revenues of proprietors, but also on the profits of all the members of laborious classes. It is even generally true that though the proprietors have more overplus, they spare less for having more treasure they have more desires and more passions they think themselves better insured of their fortune and are more desirous of enjoying it contentedly than to augment it luxury is their pursuit the stipendiary class and chiefly the undertakers of the other classes 
receiving profits proportionate to their advances, talents, and activity, have, though they are not possessed of a revenue properly so called, a superfluity beyond their subsistence. But absorbed, as they generally are, only in their enterprises, and anxious to increase their fortune, restrained by their labor from amusements and expensive passions, they save their whole superfluity to reconvert it in other enterprises and augment it. The greater part of the undertakers in agriculture borrow but little, and they almost all rest on the capital of their own funds. The undertakers of other businesses, who wish to render their fortune stable, strive likewise to attain to the same state. Those that make their enterprises on borrowed funds are greatly in danger of failing. However, although capitals are formed in part by the saving of profits in the laborious classes, yet as those profits spring always from the earth, they are almost all repaid, either by the revenue or in the expenses that serve to produce the revenue. It is evident that the capitals are derived from the earth as well as the revenue, or rather, that they are but an accumulation of a part of the riches produced by the earth, which the proprietors of the revenue, or those that share it, are able to lay by every year in store, without consuming it on their wants. 101. Although money is the direct object in saving, and it is, if we may call it so, the first foundation of capitals, yet money and specie form but an insensible part in the total sum of capitals. We have seen what an inconsiderable part money forms in the total sum of existing capitals, but it makes a very large one in the formation of them. In fact, almost all savings are only in money. It is in money that the revenue is paid to the proprietors, that the advances and profits are received by the undertakers of every kind. It is their money which they save, and the annual increase of capitals happens in money. But all the undertakers make no other use of it than immediately to convert it into the different kinds of effects on which their enterprises turn. Thus, money returns into circulation, and the greater part of capitals exist only, as we have already explained it, in effects of different natures. End of Reflections on the Formation and Distribution of Wealth by Anne Robert Jacques Turgot, translated by Nicholas de Condorcet, recording by Jeff Edward Dumas.